This is episode 68 of the Immunology Podcast, Blood Transfusions with Dr. David Gibb. Hey everyone, this is Dr. Jason Goldsmith and Dr. Brenda Rout. Welcome back to the Immunology Podcast, where we have conversations with immunologists. The Immunology Podcast is brought to you by Stem Cell Technologies, a global biotechnology company supporting life science research and fostering communication and collaboration in science. If you enjoy the Immunology Podcast, rate us and leave us a review. We're always looking for feedback on how the podcast can be improved and for suggestions on guests. Today, we have Dr. David Gibb from Cedar sinai on the podcast to talk about his research on sickle cell disease, lupus, and red blood cell transfusions. We also got our usual roundup of recent highlights in immunology news coming up, but first... The annual meeting of the American Association of Immunologists is taking place from May 3rd to May 7th in Chicago, 2024, of course. You can learn more at immunology.2024.aai.org. Well, one conference to another, Brenda, but we're recording live from IUIS. Live, this ladies one here. and gentlemen. Where are we again? We are in Cape Town, South Africa. Indeed. And I think I know what day of the week it is, but I'm not sure. <laughs> Dear listeners, Jason is still jet lagged from his transatlantic flight. That would be very true. Yeah, but his flight. I mean, I don't feel sorry one bit for him because... How did you, how was your flight? It was wonderful. I got to sleep horizontal in a bed. So, you know, I can't complain too much. I no. was well rested. The duck confit was fabulous on the plane. That's what I had for lunch. <laughs> what did you have? Some un, unspecified pasta with some sauce that was, I guess, spicy just to mask how dull it was in general. Was the sauce red or cream red. based? It was a red sauce. It was a red sauce with okay. uh, some pepper, too much pepper in it. But you're pretty sure it was tomato based then. I I don't know. It was red. I hope it was tomato. Who knows? And what else did you have? So duck on the duck oh, confit. Well, that was the main course. Let's see. It started out with a butternut squash soup. There was a salad. Oh my god. There was a smoked salmon plate. Oh. Then there was some rolls. You're killing me. Here. Then there was duck confit with uh, was it a risotto thing? And then I had the cheese course I decided for dessert. And that okay. went with some wine pairings. You, wine pair, you can <laughs> stop now. Dear listener, especially those who are also like us in Cape Town, I imagine that like me, most of us came in, you know, a cheap economy. So I feel you. And I hope that you all made it safely, that you're recovering from your jet lag. Uh, but now it's too late because by the time this goes out, it's going to be already you will be, be still back. flying back from IUIS, I think, is when this, the air date, no, the air date's after I get back, so. So, well, in any case, live from Cape Town, we're going to mm -hmm. do our recording. We're actually sitting in the same room, very exciting, and we're going to talk some quick science before jumping into the conference. Indeed. All right. Well, I don't have any segues here because... There's just not a good segue. I don't have an arthritis paper to talk about how I don't have hip arthritis. Fair enough. So we're just going to jump in. I'll start with a nature immunology paper. Got it. Today. Um, it is from Nature Immunology, as I said, uh, accepted October 2nd, published the 13th of November. Its title is Microbial Ligand Independent Regulation of Lymphopoiesis by Nod 1. Um, first author is Chakai. Iwamaru, and last author is Dragana Jankovic. So this is actually an interesting, cool paper. As we know, nods are these intracellular cytosolic uh, sensors for innate immune signaling we think about. A lot of work's been done on nod in relation to microbial products. This paper actually kind of went back and looked at the knockouts in the mice and figured out some really cool stuff, what was going on. So there's two knockouts for nod one. One is one that... Uh, knocks out the whole protein. There's no mRNA transcript left. The other one is one that gets rid of the card domain and has the rest of it. And they looked at this and they looked at the lymphoid compartments and in terms of just the bone marrow and then lymph tissues, lymph nodes, thymus. And they found that in both of the knockouts, there was decreased amounts of lymphoid cells, so adaptive immune cell generation over time. And they found it was actually worse with the card nod one knockout than the full knockout. It was actually negative versus just absent. Um, so they have these mild lymphopenias, and then they looked at, you know, using antibiotic ablation because they didn't want to do germ-free studies, which I don't blame them, and this didn't have any antibiotic phenotypes. So it's not microbial-driven. Um, and then I really honed in and saw that this CARD 
Delta cards. The card knockout had the worst phenotype, and they were able to use CRISPR to knock out the card region as well, and that then reverted it to look like a true, just general Nod1 knockout. So they really established that this, this card minus protein was doing something extra funky. So, and they did some crosses and other work and looked at co-expression of cell of signaling pathways. And unsurprisingly, um, based on what people know about Nod, um, a couple things. One, they linked it to STAT5, but it wasn't RIP2 um, dependence. RIP2 is one of the main molecules that signals through Nod, but the other one that you can get through is STAT5. And so STAT5 is what was driving this in general. And so they did some different cytokines like IL-3 or IL-7, did a genetic knock-in that could overdrive it. So if you put IL-7 constitutively active, you could recover the mice's lymphopenia and restore it back to baseline by overdriving. But what they found was that this um, it's cytoplas- cytosolic nod is interacting with the STAT5 signaling complex. And so normally it's promoting its phosphorylation. The card one, bite, the one missing card, kind of serves as a protein sink and sucks it all up and doesn't let any of it get phosphorylated. Whereas in its absence entirely, some gets phosphorylated. You just lose the nod dependent phosphorylation versus having a bad actor sink. And so what they're able to show is that this nod one through stat five is regulating um, hematopoiesis of lymphoid cells, right? And so then they're able to show that it impairs adaptive immunity. They did um, a toxoplasmosis Gandhi infection and showed that they had worse infection in this case. They really were able to establish that, that nod is acting independent of the microbiome to generate lymphoid cells at baseline in, you know, normal mice as a, as a main component of what it does. So it has a function outside of um, bacterial pattern recognition. Pretty cool. Yeah. So we did not know this at all. Do we? Not really. There was some indication something funky was going on, but I don't think anyone ever actually did the work to figure it out. I think it's so interesting when, when we find out that this um, molecules, which we have found a, a very clear uh, function years ago already, they all of a sudden they surprise us. And they're actually part of also keeping natural homeostasis that we didn't even know it. Um, it's clearly that we are recycling and reusing these molecules all the time for different yeah. pathways. Well, they also showed like anti, you lose anti-tumor immunity. So they did like a melanoma injection, but also a T-cell colitis is better if you have not one knockout because you don't have any T-cells. Yeah. But like, like the disease patterns also match. Like, yeah. if you want T-cells to prevent a disease, it's bad. If you don't want T-cells, it's good. True. So they, 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 did, they did some good work to kind of bolster it. But really the point is it's, it's mediating STAT5 independent of microbial signals. All right. Okay. I like it. Uh, did you mention the authors of this paper? I did. Ah, I missed it. Okay. You're also a little jet lagged. <laughs> Not really. I have like one hour difference only. But I mean, you were traveling. Hold yeah. It up. So, you know, you, I have was to, traveling. you have to stretch your body and your mind Yes. Back up. Yes, because you can definitely not stretch your body in those tight, tight economy seats. Okay. Uh, for my first paper of today, uh, I have a, uh, a, a paper published in Immunity. Uh, it's more like a resource because it's a very descriptive paper, but I think it was good uh, to, to, to talk about this. Uh, this paper was published in Immunity December. 12, so it's uh, a little bit ahead of schedule. And it's called Single Cell Atlas of Healthy Human Blood Unveils Age-Related Loss of NKG2C Positive Gramzyme B Negative CD8 Positive Memory T-Cells and Accumulation of Type 2 Memory Cells. A little bit of mouth, mouthful. Uh, first authors are uh, Marina Tere- Terekova, Amanda Swain, Pavla Bahakova from the lab of Maxim Artyomov uh, from the uh, Washington University School of Medicine. And as I said, basically what they did in this, in this, in this paper is that uh, they did a very extensive analysis of PBMCs derived from various donors of various ages. And they tried to find, characterize how um, the immune system changes through age, which we know it does. 
And I think, but I think mostly they did a very, very large sample size. And I must, I, I must imagine the analysis must have been very, um, very interesting uh, and quite tough. And they um, could uh, get some conclusions. And I think it's very interesting. I, I think it's always good to see this kind of asset, this kind of studies. What happens with age, I think is super interesting. So let's dive in. Um, so basically, what did we do? They took uh, samples from uh, three. So we had 317 PVMC samples from 166 individuals. Uh, these people were all kind of deemed healthy and aging normally. There was a lot of kind of clinical assays that were accompanied the, the, the samples. Um, and basically, they collected, they did single cell sequencing of in total 2 million cells. And so that must have been a lot of work. So in general, from each patient, uh, they, 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 they collected this over three years. And they, uh, uh, I think it's interesting for how, how do you analyze, how do you make such a huge data, uh, data set? They made 14 individual batches. Uh, they were collecting about 6,000 cells per sample, and they could detect up to 1,300 cells per gene. So that's kind of the, 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 sta the, the basic stats of this, of this analysis. And they did a lot of uh, correlations with age. They analyzed kind of different cohorts of people, and they associated in, in, in cohorts according to their age. And a lot of the other fun, to be honest, is not, is not new. Uh, we do know, of course, that the immune system changes a lot through age, especially, you know, in the late, after, you know, 50s, 60s, you do see. And mainly what you see is one of the most important things, you see a reduction in the amount of naive cells that you find in the, in the, in the blood that is well, has been well documented. Um, and they, of course, they see it here. And this is the case for, for CD4, CD8. Um, they also see a reduction in other cells, subsets, such as mate uh, cells, um, which uh, they, that stands for, for, I always forget the, it stands for mucosal associated invariant cells, which I'm going to actually be talking about in the next, uh, for the next paper. So they also see a reduction in the cells throughout age, particularly in those uh, age groups uh, of uh, around um, after nice after 60 and 70 years old and um, another thing so what do we say when they look at they looked at the different uh, subsets and I, we, we focus kind of on T cells I think T cells are the ones that are mostly affected by age and what they see is uh, when it comes to the CD4 cells they see a reduction in um, uh, they see that usually CD4 cells, they, the percentage of the are in PBMCs, they stay uh, kind of constant, but you see a reduction of uh, uh, naive cells. And you see a reduction also in the case of regulatory T cells, of uh, naive regulatory T cells, and an increase of kind of pre previously activated uh, memory regulatory T cells. But probably the thing that caught their attention the most is that there is an increase in the uh, amount of cells with a Th2 um, phenotype. And I think this also has been kind of, I don't think it's super surprising, but it's really cool to see it in such a large data set and uh, throughout all these very kind of de detailed uh, analyses. Another thing that you see again is an increase in memory cells, so uh, uh, measured by HLADR, uh, also that, that really steadily grows uh, with age. And you see that within uh, these activated memory cells and this uh, and this more terminal, there's also some populations of more terminal differentiated effector cells. What you also see is that although the numbers don't change uh, statistically in a stati statistically significant way, you do see that there's uh, changes in their clonality, and you see an increased kind of uh, they, they are the ones that are shown the most clonal. Uh, um, distribution of their TCRs, and that also shows that uh, it, with time this increases as well. Um, I thought it was also very, um, very interesting that uh, when they look into the CD8 cells, or they also, they also um, analyze the, the, the CD8 compartment, and in this case what they see is, I think is very interesting that the absolute number of CD8 cells decreases 
Uh, so if the percentage of uh, the CDH cells are of the PMCs decreases with time. And this results in kind of a um, growing, ever-growing ratio of CD4 to CD8. And this also uh, does um, correlate with, with, uh, with age quite strongly. Um, and this one, so also, so here's the, another thing that I see. They also see an increase in the percentage kind of, 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 of CD8 cells with that kind of a TH2 uh, phenotype. CD8 cells are expressing CCR4 and that are, uh, when stimulated, they express certain uh, cytokines that are related to uh, CD4, um, CD4, uh, CD4 to TH2 identity. So, and that they uh, have a signature, a, a transcriptomic signature that is so often associated with TH2 cells. So basically what they see is a small shift or a consistent shift from a more TH2 kind of uh, signature, both in CD4 cells, but also in CD8. And in particular, there is um, this, uh, the, this, this um, population that they find, which is a uh, population uh, of um, the, 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 the ones that they mentioned, in their uh, in their uh, was in the in the title, which are cells that are expressing CD8 cells that are expressing NKG2C uh, 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 molecule, and they're actually they see that that they really do comprise a defined population that actually decreases with uh, with age, and I think they were a little bit surprised about this because these are kind of some kind of activated uh, cluster, and they usually you should expect this to increase, uh, but uh, it's not the case for for this one. And this type of this, they don't seem to find any references to this particular subpopulation uh, in literature. So they think that this is a new population of kind of unknown, <laughs> uh, unknown um, relevance, but that is clearly present in these donors and is clearly being reduced with age. Um, so yeah, so in principle, um, I thought it was really nice because it's always good to see this very deep dives into something so important as age and how it affects the immune system. I think it's a great uh, tool for anybody interested in this. So basically they see in a nutshell, they see using all these samples, they find that there's an increase, of course, the an increase in the memory compartments, both for CD4s, uh, and uh, and they see an increase also in um, the CD4 CD8 ratio in general. They identify this population of of, of cells that um, that they haven't seen before, they haven't really been described before, and they they show kind of a general shift towards a Th2 phenotype in older age. And when it, they see, uh, of course, a reduction in, in naive cells, and this is particularly uh, clear and relevant for CD8 cells, and um, and that this seems to be kind of general, a generalizable highlight of of old of, of an aged immune system. So, what's going to happen to me when I get even older, Brenda? Well, for once, you're going to start having less naive cells, and you're going to have more activated cells and more memory cells that have remembered all those things you went through in your life, all those memories. That doesn't older. sound good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, the truth is also that is when you see this data, the spread is also huge, right? There's so much variability. Even you collect, I mean, the trends are pretty clear, but there's so many uh, outliers in every of the measurements they show that... Maybe you're one of those outliers. You never know. For Maybe I'm a special good snowflake. Or for bad. Well, I got nothing. I got no segue here either. Because uh, I guess as you get older, you get cancer. So we're going to talk about cancer. There we go. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Yay, fun. cancer. All right. Uh, so this is in Nature Cell Biology, published the 13th of November. Received the 8th of April, 2021, and accepted the 26th of September, 2023. Oh, my God. Whoa. Oh, oh boy. All yeah. right. Yeah. Ouch. So, so thank you all for getting it out here. We have three first authors, Katrina Evans, Kerrigan Blake, and Aaron Longsworth. 
Last author is uh, Devin A. Lawson. It is microglia promote anti-tumor immunity and suppress breast cancer metastases. So high level, we know in cancer and metastases that macrophages often are bad actors. They're these tumor uh, activating macrophages, right? They create this immunosuppressive phenotype. They kind of go into the microenvironment and help the, in, the, the, the cancer evade the rest of the immune system. And a part of the problem is that microglia, which are brain macrophages, being able to separate that out has been tough. And in many cancers, brain mets are kind of the, uh, the kiss of death, right? Like if you have brain metastases, you're not, you're not getting out anymore. Um, so what they were able to do is, based on other recent work, they use a brain cancer metastasis model where they inject these tumors into the blood vessels, into the vasculature, and they seed in the brain pretty well. Um, that are GFP fluorescent. And um, they're able to use single-cell RNA-seq with a newly established microglial signature to see what's going on there. Um, so they do this first and are able to find different groups of macrophages, including the microglia. And then they were, you know, so they were able to hone in on the signature and then really define it more strongly. And then they were able to um, do, and then they kind of showed that the microglia are having an inflammatory response as compared to other um, groups. So they're able to analyze these microglia, and they kind of came up with different cell programs using a um, probabilistic clustering method that they used. And so they were able to find ones that had an interferon response, one that had an antigen preventing presenting response, one that had a secretary response. Um, and they were able to kind of identify these programs and really show that the microglia had an antigen presenting and inflammatory response compared to the other macrophage groups. And then they extended this out to other bone cancer metastases model and said, or so no, sorry, brain, breast cancer metastases to the brain and show that, hey, that other, other cells do this. this isn't just a feature of the one, you know, cell we decided to inject. So then they used a, a knockout model um, based on this fire gene, which is this FMS intrinsic regulatory element that was been shown previously to cause mice to lose microglia alone versus other macrophages. And they showed that if you use this knockout system, uh, you have worse cancer. So they were able to get it into, you know, very specifically showing that microglia were holding tumor in check. And so then they showed that the other thing they saw with these knockouts is you had less NK and T cell responses. And so they did some pseudotime analysis and some other, other work uh, using rag mice and other work in you know, mice without T cells, as well as SP1 inhibitors, to show that the microglia were working with the T cells to coordinate the anti-tumor response. And that really honing in in what happens, um, and that the, if you lose T cells, there's actually a feedback loop to the microglia. And so these antigen presenting microglia subtype is in a feedback loop. So you have these T cells, they respond to the cancer, the microglia, and then start presenting antigen to support that. And so if you lose either one, you break the chain. And so they established this by doing a T cell knockout. So you could see this chain keep going. And in this knockout, if you got rid of the T cells, you have less anti antigen presenting microglia type and less of a cancer response. And so then they showed that in a humanized mouse system that this microglia response also persisted using, using this system. So long and short, it seems that my, unlike regular macrophages, which tend to be uh, tumor supportive, microglia in the brain have a very active role through antigen presentation of coordinated T cell response against the tumors in the brain. And so it's a different role than what we've classically thought about macrophages, and they were able to do this based on new tools that let them specifically target macroglia versus other macrophages. I like that. It's like a little bit of, um, they always get such a bad rep. I always think of microglia as kind of getting in the way, but it seems that if you give them the right uh, tools or the right combination of signa signals, they can actually be helpful. You know, some, you know, I know you're a B cell, Brenda, but I am a macrophage and we do hard work. <laughs> a redemption. That's the word I was looking for. Yeah, macrophages will be redeemed. <laughs>
All right. All right. Um, so for the last uh, talk of the day, um, before we head off to the conference, I have another kind of, uh, the, uh, another uh, piece of uh, research looking into understanding specific cells using single cell RNA-seq, very popular technique these days. Um, so this is a paper from Science Immunology called Transcriptomes and Metabolism Define Mouse and Human Mate Cell Populations. First authors are Shilipi Chandra, Gabriel Ascui, and Thomas Riefelmacher. Uh, from the lab of uh, Mitchell Cronenberg at La Jolla Institute for Immunology, and basically what they did in this in this in this work, they really took a close look into what is the diversity uh, within the the mate cell pop, mate cell population, um, and so let me just quickly introduce. I think sometimes we don't we don't get to talk a lot about these cells. So as I mentioned before, mates are mucosal associated invariant T cells. And I think they're really cool because they are characterized by uh, having kind of a fairly uh, restricted TCR repertoire. And they are capable of recognizing uh, a MR, MR1, which is a uh, MHC class 1-like protein, which is non-polymorphic, so it's kind of always the same. And that can bind... Uh, to a molecule core called 5-2-oxopropodinamino-60-ribitylaminouracil. I tried to practice that, but well, we're going to say just 5 op ru um, and other metabolites that are usually produced by bacteria and yeast. So in a way, they make some kind of this innate-ish type of cell, recognizing uh, some kind of PAMPs in a way. Um, and mate cells are abundant in humans. Um, they're also found on mice. And they, when you look at their TCRs, they, they express a TCR alpha beta, uh, but they are expressing very specific uh, beta, uh, beta alpha chain uh, with these uh, TRAB1, one, uh, uh, one, two, and this TRAG33. So uh, these uh, A is this variable and, and, and junction uh, segments very specific. And this is kind of both the same for the, the human and the mouse bear, the mouse version, they express uh, this, this, two, uh, this, this alpha chain, and then they associate with a very limited amount of beta chain uh, variants. And we know that these mate cells, they can recognize and uh, proliferate and they recognize this, uh, the, um, this metabolite on this MR1, uh, and they... Uh, upon that, they they proliferate, they produce cytokines and and uh, perforin, granzymes. So this really seems that made to make these cells kind of first responders. Um, and so in this paper, they dive a little bit deeper into this population. So like T cells, uh, because they're T cells, made cells originate in thymus. So they do go through some kind of selection, but it's a weird selection because they can be also stimulated in the thymus because of the uh, the fact that this metabolite might be also presented in the thymus. So it's a weird, they do it differently to traditional alpha beta cells. Um, and when you look at the periphery, uh, we have kind of very kind of clear differences between the mouse and the human situation. So let's talk about the mouse. Mouse, the, the in, 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 in mice, the most the largest mate self subset has a kind of a th17 like uh, phenotype it expresses organ t uh, and ex and can produce il17 but there's also another smaller but present t bed expressing uh, population which is called mate 1 so the other ones were mate 17 and these are mate 1 and in principle could all can also express uh, produce interferon gamma and when it comes, when you compare it to the human situation, it's usually more difficult to find this this uh, separation. They usually uh, it's not so clear. And so, what do they do in this in this paper? They take a lot of organs and, and tissues and thymus from mice, and they also find samples from organs and also thymi from humans. And they do some kind of deep dive into their single cell RNA seq, and they use this to kind of 
give a more robust classification and characterization of these subsets of mate cells. When they come to human, to uh, mouse cells, they sort it, basically they take cells from different organs, thymus, lungs, liver, spleens, and they uh, sorted them uh, for sort of those cells that actually recognize the target of mate cells. So to kind of, uh, we're using tetramers, so to uh, isolate this, uh, this 5 op ru specific T cells, assuming that the majority of these are going to be mate cells. Technically, you could potentially have a regular T cell that recognizes that, but um, in principle, most of the cases, they are expressing this TRAB1,2 uh, 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 alpha chain. And they, they really look into the transcriptomes and they started doing some kind of clustering and they can define these clusters, the mate ones, the mate 17, basically. So again, the mate 17s are kind of a majority. Uh, they are three different clusters uh, are kind of, can be characterized as mate 17 and a different cluster that uh, uh, encompasses the mate one signature. And they show that they can use actually uh, extracellular markers, ICOS and CXCR3 to differentiate one from the other. So ICOS is usually expressed strongly in the, because it's, it correlates with raw gamma T. Uh, is you, they can use it to mark mate 17 cells and CXCR3, uh, which is correlated with T-bed, uh, with, then they use this to kind of um, detect or to characterize mate one population. This allows them to also do some f uh, cytometry analysis based on these markers. And they show that uh, there is, uh, again, in mice, there's a majority of, of expression of, 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 of majority of the mate cells are mate 17 cells. Um, and uh, particularly in, in, in tissue, in lung tissue. But then, for example, in the case of the liver, you see more of a representation of CXCR3 positive mate one like cells. Um, so they do see differences. Each organ seems to have some kind of speci specialization when it comes to the mate populations that uh, uh, inhabit them. Uh, and they show again in this, in this, um, uh, these this cells can express, for example, IL-17, this mates, uh, this mate 17 cells found in this organ, they do express uh, IL-17. And although they don't find uh, um, interferon gamma production in those uh, cells that they, they, they analyze, they do see TNF alpha, they see TNF alpha uh, producing cells, uh, which they associate with mate 1. So what they see basically is that different organs, they test different tissues, there's kind of a mostly... Uh, um, th uh, th 17, uh, mate 17 like cells, but you do find mate ones uh, in uh, liver and, and potentially spleen. So, what I thought was also pretty cool uh, is they do they look at the mate cells in the thymus again because the differentiation is probably different. Like we know that it's different to regular uh, standard uh, um, T cell uh, maturation in the thymus. And they use different markers and use this transcriptomic analysis to kind of make a trajectory analysis uh, to try to define how these mate cells are, are produced in the thymus. And they show kind of this two-stage, they ended up, uh, end up uh, describing a two-stage pr pr procedure in which at some point you, have a, you end up with an immature uh, mate cell that then uh, divides into either of the two branches, the mate 1 or the mate 17. Uh, and then they can show this using trajectory analysis. So it's also, it's, I think it's very interesting. And um, basically, uh, they, they, they show that uh, there are some markers such as 3D24, CD44 that allow to kind of describe the steps in this, in this um, development in the thymus. Uh, what I thought was really cool is that they also look into some of the metabolic, the metabolism of these cells. And it's always kind of an interesting thing. Um, they, they, they seem to find that it's mate 17 cells from the mice, so far it's been all mouse data, that they have this uh, increased uh, signature scores for oxidative phosphorylation, mitochondrial function, uh, fatty acid metabolism, um, and whereas mate 1 cells seem to be more prone towards glycolysis. Um, so I thought it was, thought it was interesting that uh, if, this, if it's the case that not only do they have this functional differentiation, but also kind of some uh, metabolic uh, differences that might relate to the canonical, you know, Th1 and Th17 cells. Uh, and, and their metabolism. Uh, when it comes to the human, so they actually then do some human studies. Again, unsurprisingly, they find that it's much harder to, to find. They, they do this also, this tetramer analysis, but it's much harder to find 
different, these diff, two different populations. They made one and made, and made 17. So in the humans, the situation is much less clear. Um, and they see features of both in many of the cells. Um, they don't see, you know, rogram I see rogram T very strongly expressed uh, in, in one cluster. Uh, so I think it's kind of a little bit more, um, a little bit more, uh, less clear. Uh, they do see an increased uh, fatty acid uptake and storage also for these cells kind of resembling the mouse situation, but they don't seem to find this accompanied with a higher mit mitochondrial function, uh, which is also thing is interesting. So uh, in, um, the last thing they do is also see what happens to the mates uh, populations when uh, they analyze mice that are have a kind of more wild type microbiota. They take other mice from pet stores or they co-host um, uh, Lab mice, lab mice with this mice too, so they would get their uh, microbiota, and they seem to find that in the case of these mice, they seem to lose a little bit of the uh, mate seventeen pred predominance uh, in favor of an increase of mate one cells, uh, which might so, which might show how the mate populations could be uh, affected by the environment. Uh, but I think they're not; it's not something very extraordinary, but they do see this effect when they are cross-fostered or when they are uh, pet shop mice. So yeah, um, I don't think I think about enough about mate cells. I think they're pretty cool. No, oh, it's super interesting. Uh, I also think it's interesting how sloppy it is in humans compared to mice. I wonder why that is. Yeah. Is it the tools? Is it different biology? Uh, it might be different biology. Well, here they say this thing, right? That if uh, in case of the, of the mice that... Um, if they are co-housed, they have like more kind of uh, experience immune system. Maybe that affects, or maybe just seeing this effect on these mice is that this uh, clear cut difference might be something artificial. Oh, uh, that the housing is driving it, and humans yeah. obviously are not co-housed very well together. I mean, they are. They are, we are the definition of whatever. Like we have microbiota all over the place. So well, it's, our, it does correlate with who you live with. True, it very does. much actually. The two things that drive it are who you live with and your immune system. Yeah. But yeah, no, it's interesting. I went, but I wonder if it, as we keep seeing, you know, different T cell populations or pick something, it's kind of a smear much more in humans than it is in, in animals. And I wonder if that's just a human feature that we're yeah. not as, that we have kind of a, a T cell skid mark, as it were, kind of like, you know, they, they like, we, yeah. we like these ones and twos and 17s and regs and this and everything in humans is a little, little bit mixed. Yeah. They do see differences in the development. It's hard to compare because for the human thymus, they have like very young uh, human thymus. Um, but they do see differences also in the development. Things like there's a, a stage in human uh, mite development in which they see RAC2 and RAC1 expression and they don't find a population in mouse, in mouse thymus apparently. So there seems there might be something already in the, in the actual development in the thymus that is substantially different. That's interesting. Interesting. All right. Well, I don't know what day it is or what time it is, but I do know we're going to be speaking to Dr. Gabe, David Gibb here at Cedar sinai in just a moment. But before we get to that, are you attending an upcoming cell or gene therapy conference? Enter to win one of three $500 US dollar awards from Stem Cell Technologies towards your conference travel or registration fee. The contest closes on December 15th and is open to residents of select countries only. Full eligibility rules can be found on the registration form. Visit www.stemcell.com slash CGT award to learn more. Now for our interview in the second part of the show, we are very happy to have as a guest, Dr. David Gibb. He is an assistant professor at the Cedar sinai Medical Center, and his lab studies inflammatory mechanisms in patients with diseases that require uh, regular blood, uh, blood transfusions and they generate immune response against red blood antigens and uh, partly because of the some pre-underlining uh, condition that these patients have. I'm very interested in this topic because I work currently at the Blood Transfusion uh, Institute of the Netherlands. So I've, I've been recently become aware of this issue. So I think it's a very interesting. I'm really happy that you're going to be here uh, discussing this with us uh, in the show. So welcome to the Immunology Podcast, David Gibb. Thank you for joining. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for having me. Just, I'm excited to talk to you all. Um, I actually didn't even know, uh, Brenda, that you were 
in transfusion medicine. So that's exciting that, uh, you know, get to chat with you a little bit about what we're doing. I must do a disclaimer. I am not in transfusion medicine, but many of my new colleagues, because I recently started. Okay. So now all of a sudden I am exposed to all of these issues that I wasn't aware of before working at a cancer institute. So although I don't do it myself, I do recognize that this is a massive medical need. So kudos to that. My, my hat as I wear a, one of the hats I wear is I am a uh, CLIA lab director for a donor screening lab. But to kind of jump in, lots of people have to have a blood transfusion in their life, right? Surgery, whatever, you know. Absolutely. Maybe most people have like, 10 units over the course of everything but the last few weeks of life type of scenario. But, you know, you're talking about patients who have a lot, right? Not, not just 10 right. units over their entire life through a few surgeries here or there, but a lot more than that more often. So what happens, generally speaking, to people who have to have a lot of transfusions? And then you have some insights that it's extra, it's extra atypical, maybe more than you'd expect just from exposure. I think is your other point that it's not just the number, but the underlying conditions that are causing some issues. So could you kind of put your general thesis out there about what's going on with these transfusions in particularly patients? For sure. Yeah. So, I mean, when we talk about matching blood type for patients, you know, from donors, um, you know, we think about ABO, RH, A positive, O negative, et cetera. And of course we always do that. Um, otherwise, you'd have a massive acute hemolytic transfusion reaction, which none of us want. Um, but, you know, what we don't think about that much is the, you know, three to 400 other antigens that are on a red blood cell, right? So, and we don't match these between donors and recipients because it's just not feasible. You know, you can't match 400 things that would never work. So, you know, patients are exposed to these foreign antigens um, on red blood cells, and you can make antibodies against those because they've never seen them before. And, you know, those antibodies are important for several different reasons, which, you know, we can go into. Um, you know, they cause issues with, you know, getting the right blood for them, the right red blood cells. Um, cause, they cause the lead hemolytic transfusion reactions. Uh, they're important in pregnancy, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, you can't make these antibodies if you've never been transfused, which I think Jason alluded to, um, or you've never been pregnant. Um, so certainly exposure um, and patients who get a lot of expo a lot of exposure, like say patients um, who are transfusion dependent, like patients with sickle cell disease. Um, and uh, clearly they have more risk, there's more chances of making antibodies that can be harmful. Um, but um, if you compare patients like with sickle cell disease and patients stay with, um, say, childhood anemia, you know, they both need transfusions, but the ones with sickle cell disease, you know, are much more likely, you know, by, you know, tenfold so to make antibodies. So, um, it's also true that patients with autoimmunity make a lot of these antibodies against red blood cells. And so that just kind of points to a bunch of literature that says if a patient is in some kind of inflammatory state, you know, they have autoimmunity, they have sickle cell disease, which is maybe one of the most inflammatory diseases I've ever come across, um, then they are much more likely to make antibody responses and not only make and a response against one antigen, but they can make a response against a dozen antigens. And if you go in the blood bank and you try to find some blood that doesn't express any of those 12 things, that's gonna be hard, you know? And, um, you know, sometimes we have to do nationwide searches, you know, just to find compatible blood. Or you, if you have to transfuse, then you do, and you give them the best thing you have, and that can be, you know, that can have, you know, potentially fatal consequences. So, you know, that is sort of sort of the gist of uh, the realm in which we are in. And, um, you know, the reason why we study our lab, particularly studies sickle cell disease, you know, they're, they're the most at risk um, population. I mean, certainly this is important. This is relevant to anyone who gets a blood transfusion, but uh, patients who are transfusion dependent 
uh, that's when it becomes, you know, especially relevant. So, so you mentioned that patient, there are certain patients that have a predisposition to generate these antibodies. So on top of, in, in comparison to other patients that have different conditions that require uh, frequent transfusions. So, and you also have research showing that there are some particular uh, immune related pathways that are seem to be exacerbating this condition. So what, what maybe you can quickly comment of what you found, for example, I think in the case of uh, interference signaling and how underlying interference signaling can increase the chances of generating such antibodies. Yeah, absolutely. So this is some of the work in mouse models. So we have these mouse transfusion models where, you know, we have um, donor mice that express some you know, antigen, some red blood cell antigen um, of human origin. And um, what was found long before I was involved um, was that if you inject a mouse, a recipient mouse with poly IC, which is a, a known um, stimulant of type one interferons, which are our antiviral interferons. So these were discovered in the 1950s for being absolutely critical to viral immunity. Um, but uh, so when mice were injected with poly IC, they seem to always make an antibody response against that red blood cell. Um, and what we found is that if we also say use viruses like influenza, we also saw the same sort of trend that uh, these mice, if they were infected with influenza and then transfused with an allogeneic red blood cell, then they would make antibodies against that red blood cell. And uh, basically the gist of what we found is that this was due to the type one interferon response. And um, so we had a variety of fancy mice that were knocked out of various transcription factors, um, receptors, uh, you know, certain signaling genes. So I'm talking about like rig eye like receptor signaling, MAVs, mediated signaling, um, IRF in the transcription factor. So if you knock out anything in the whole poly IC induced pathway, then the mice no longer made antibody. So that was um you know, a lot of the work during my postdoc. Um, and so, you know, now I've been here at Cedar Sinai, and we still work on some of the same things. I don't want to say that type 1 interferon is the only reason why people uh, respond in this way. It's certainly not, but at least in mice, um, at least in some of our particular models, and there are multiple different transfusion models um, that we use in preclinical studies, uh, but at least in this situation it seemed to be um, quite important and actually you could just take a wild type mouse and give it recombinant interferon and that's enough to induce the now immune response um, so um, that that's sort of been our focus um, and that's one reason why one part of our lab study is lupus so lupus like more than 50 percent of patients with lupus have what they call a type 1 interferon signature meaning they make type 1 interference, they turn on genes that make that type 1 interference induce. And there are many autoimmune diseases that are, are linked to type 1 interference. Uh, but lupus is probably the most well characterized as, you know, in that regard. Um, so we then extended our study away from viruses and more to autoimmune diseases um, that were associated. And so we have, um, you know, have a couple studies out there um, looking at various mouse models so far of lupus, and um, some of those models are induced, you know, alanization is induced in some of those models, and some is not. And we think that's due to the type 1 interferon signature. So it sounds then like uh, those patients who most need repeat transfusions are the ones who have too much interferon floating around and thus are extra predisposed to developing the antibodies that prevent them from getting the therapy they need is that is that kind of the the net problem statement in a way that those who need it yeah. most can have at least 
so um, yeah, so those that need it most, so patients with say sickle cell disease, I use that as an example, you know, that was another something that we and many others found that they also have this type one interferon signature. Um, and so we were very interested into whether, you know, maybe that's why, you know, patients with sickle cell disease uh, have such frequent allergization. And I, I think, you know, we haven't answered that question. I, I think it's a really difficult one to answer um, because when you're looking back at, you know, patients who have made antibodies and patients that have not, and, but at the time of transfusion, you have no idea what was going on in their inflammatory response, you know, or, um, you know, what was their interferon level? Uh, one thing we can say is that study is not by me, but by Ross Fasano and some other people at Emory um, have, have shown that patients, sickle cell patients who come in the hospital because they have like an acute chest issue or stroke or a acute uh, pain crisis, they're in, you know, excessive inflammation, those patients are 10 to 15 times more likely to have an immune response if they get a blood transfusion. Um, so, but the ones that we see every month, because a lot of these patients come in for red blood cell exchanges to get rid of the sickle cells, put into healthy red cells. They're usually, I mean, they're not, um, they still have sequelae of sickle cell disease, but they're not in an acute crisis. And they are much less likely to make an immune response if they get transfused. So it's usually the one-off patients who they don't get transfused that often, and all of a sudden something happens and they get that transfusion. There are recent studies out of Paris and some others have shown that those patients are much more likely. So I'm not sure that was what you were looking for, uh, Jason, but. <laughs> I guess that uh, that brings me to an actual question is, what do we do about it? Can we either prevent these antibodies to from happening? Can we, once we detect them, can we keep them in check? Or either, or can we, I don't know, make synthetic blood that doesn't have any of these antigens? What are the solutions? What are people working on to to uh, get around this problem? Yeah. So the current state of things is the only way to prevent the antibody response is not to be exposed to that antigen. So what they do is they uh, say for patients with sickle cell disease at not all medical centers, but um, probably more than half by now, um, do match for other antigens other than the ABO and the RH. So there's three other antigens, and they're called CE and KEL. So those are the ones that patients with sickle cell make antibodies against most commonly. Um, so we are able here at Cedar sinai and many other, you know, uh, academic institutions match, you know, blood for those patients to prevent them from at least making you know, antigens, uh, antibodies against five antigens. Um, you can, if you have a situation where you're very worried about human like transfusion reactions, uh, you can extend it even further. So there are other antigens. You can go to about eight or nine antigens you can match, but that blood is very hard to get. Um, and especially if they need, uh, you know, a blood exchange where they need about 10 units every month, that's kind of hard. So there are some some institutions, you know, um, so I know that the policy of Johns Hopkins is that, you know, they will not match unless extended antigen matching, unless the patient has already made an antibody. And then once they make an antibody, they do do extended antigen matching. A lot of it has to do with, you know, how many patients with sickle cell disease do you see? And what is your blood donor um, environment? You know, or do you have donors that you could potentially match them? Or are you in a place where, you know, the, and the population does not have the same sort of antigens that your patients do? Um, and so it, it, it's, 
you know, so there's some of those situations that play a role. Um, so we don't really use immunosuppressants. Um, I get that question a lot um, for patients if we're worried about them making antibodies. Um, and I mean, I think it's definitely possible. Um, I, I've sort of on a, a part of some case reports where they've used steroids or various things to try to prevent this. Um, but, you know, the the main, if I take a step back, like making one antibody against an antigen, you know, is not the end of the world, right? So lots of people, you know, not, I wouldn't say lots of people, three to 10% of people in hospitals make antibodies, you know, they get already positive blood and, you know, whatever, um, might cause slight delay in transfusions in the future. But the real issue is that once those patients come back five years later, and now we can't detect those antibodies anymore because something that uh, is, you know, somewhat unique to these antibodies is that they, what they call evanescence, so they go down and then our techniques to detect them are not that sensitive. So then they come back several years later and we give them another transfusion and we just give them, you know, what we typically give them, uh, not knowing about their history. And then all of a sudden they have this anamnestic, like huge, massive antibody response. And they start hemolyzing all the blood that we gave them. And so they're hemo so we're trying to increase their blood counts, but they're actually going down because they're hemolyzing everything. And then when it gets really serious is when they start hemolyzing not only the blood we've given them, but their own red blood cells, something called hyperhemolysis or bystander hemolysis, which is not something we fully understand. I think it's complement uh, mediated, but um, and then they they you know hemolyze even their own cells, their own sickle cells, et cetera. And then that's when you have a uh, you know potentially fatal situation. Um, so um, so matching and preventing the response is is really where we are now. So. Yeah. Here in the Netherlands, so what I hear from uh, my colleagues that work with, with the transfusion, transfusion medicine, a huge issue, especially for patients with sickle cell uh, uh, anemia and, and, and then other diseases that are kind of associated with certain ethnic groups or with certain uh, backgrounds, that often they don't find, they don't have enough donors uh, that match because usually here, most most donors have uh, one particular uh, 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 background, and then it's really hard to recruit people to donate uh, that 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 have have a higher chance of sharing these antigens because of uh, similar backgrounds. So I don't know if that's also a case in America. Things are a lot more a little bit more diverse in that sense, but I can imagine that it's going to be logistically very hard. Yeah. So I mean, I think what you're alluding to is that the donors population is very different from, say, patients who are sick of their back of their ethnicity. So 80% of donors in the United States is just what it is. They are of Caucasian background. Um, and uh, when especially patients with sickle cell disease, they're either Hispanic or African-American in the US, or there are some African uh, ethnicity. Um, and you know, the the amount of antigens that different ethnicities, you know, express is very different. And um, clearly, if you're being exposed to a certain set of antigens that you don't have, your risk is higher. Um, you know, so that's, um, that's certainly an, an important con contributing factor to you know, allergization or the making of antibodies against red blood cells. So they're, you know, the overall view of what matter, you know, what what matters when we're thinking about who's going to make antibodies or not, you know, their donor factors. So this is one of the donor factors we just talked about. There are things about like storage and a very controversial issue. Like if you store, like if you have old blood, is that more, is that worse for you? You know, there's been a lot of clinical trials on that. Um, 
you know, uh, and the side that really my research was really based on what's going on in the recipient, you know, is in the inflammatory state, et cetera. But they all matter, you know, for sure. So why do you think immunosuppressants or something like TOSI or a type one response don't work at all? I wouldn't say they don't work. I would say that there's has not been enough studies to um, you know, to be convincing enough to actually try and use it. You know, so you know, we talk about type one interference. I mean, this was we our first study in mice, you know, was in 2016, 17, something like that. So it has not been that long. And we haven't done anything in humans to show that it matters, right? So um, theoretically, it makes sense, you know, we, uh, but we, we have not had any studies where we go and take samples before transfusion, you know, a month after transfusion, and, you know, look at the and the interferon levels, say, or the interferon stimuli gene expression, and then uh, look at whether those patients made antibodies against their transfused cells or not. You know, um, so a pers perspective long study like that just hasn't been done. And it's, logistically, it's a little bit tough. Uh, that can be done. Um, you know, the really hard ones are. You know, when people, like I mentioned, looking back, who got, who became, who made antibodies, who didn't, um, do they now have a, you know, some evidence of having this interferon response or not? Um, and that's really hard to know because you don't know what happened when they got transfused. Yeah, so that's probably why. I mean, I think we had a trial studies, perspective studies, and could follow patients for a long time. Then, um, then that would be, you know, that's the evidence you would need to use it clinically. So I guess what next then is it A, more trials and then B, more mechanism? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> we try not to answer our questions so we have more questions to, to keep our jobs, you know. But um, yeah, so there's a lot we don't know. You know, we we sort of know that maybe a certain pathway or two are very important, but what are they really doing, you know? And, um, you know, interference has effects on tons of cells. You know, every cell in the body has an interference receptor, you know? I mean, we think that they're important for antigen presentation, T cell activation, B cell activation, but, you know, we're just kind of, you know, they're, there's lots of mechanisms that we don't know. And I'm only talking about one pathway, you know, other models have looked at you know, FFV signaling pathways that may be important. Um, you know, and so, yeah, more, we always need to learn more. Yeah. Um, and, but I think the trials, you know, something like that, at least uh, with human samples is, would be important to push this forward, you know, so. Uh, we are doing things with, you know, we have our mice, mouse models that I mentioned, but we also have um, some studies with, you know, human samples uh, from our sickle cell patients and also our blood donors and looking at various different inflammatory responses that they're making when they, their, say, macrophages interact with red blood cells. Um, and, but we're still very far away from translating it, you know, to clinical so that's one of the long-term goals, right? Try to say that you made a difference. I just want to make one quick question regarding your mouse model. So when you when you say you have mouse models, you mentioned that you use the human antigens on mice. Do mice naturally have also similar issues? I mean, you might usually get transfusions, but do you have also this kind of very uh diverse a set of, of, of RBC antigens on mouse cells? So in different strains, I think that's possible. You know, if you have a black six and a valve C, something like that, you know, there are certainly some differences. Um, but a lot of our models, what we use is, you know, we have to be somewhat deductionist, if I guess that is a word, um, meaning that you have to get rid of a lot of different variables. 
So it's one reason why human studies are so hard is because, you know, there are so many differences in the different antigen expression. Um, in mice, you know, we can get rid of that variable and just focus on one, you know. So mouse model we have expresses a human glycoprotein that expresses something called a kill antigen. And um, other than that, between a wild type and this kill expressing mouse, they're exactly the same. Same background, everything. Um, so that allows you to reduce the other variables and just focus on the antibody response against one. Um, so there have been some studies where they've added in two. So red blood cells that add um, that have two different proteins, different antigens um, that would be allogeneic to a wild type mouse. And um, interestingly enough, that you know they've shown that if you have an antibody response against one of those, um, then you're more likely to make it against the other one as well. Um, so for you know mechanistic reasons that I'm not sure we fully understand, but I think. If you're generating an antibody response against one, you're producing a lot of the factors that are important to induce antibodies against something else. The famous slippery slope model, terrible mm -hmm. in immunology. All right. Well, that being said, we could have a slippery slope and talk forever, but I have to come up with bad <laughs> segues to move things on. Uh, so before we end our chats, I always like to ask a fun question or two. And so for you, the one we wanted to ask was, what is the best piece of advice you've ever had, professional or otherwise, the, the thing that still has stuck with you that you would pass on to others? Yeah, so I can go back pretty far on this one. Um, I was an undergraduate student uh, doing my first research experiment, experiment um, or project for my senior thesis and worked with someone named Klaus Lay, who was... was um, you know, a well-known immunologist who's been several different places. Um, and he was my mentor. And, you know, I was asking various questions about, well, how does this work? How do, how do these immune responses work, et cetera, et cetera. And basically what he, he told me is like, you know, what percent of the knowledge out there, you know, about, you know, the, the specific uh, project I was working on that we actually know you know, and that we can use and how much have we learned? Um, and I don't know what I probably like, I said something like 50% or something. And, you know, his answer was, uh, I think it's more like 1% or less than 1%. Um, so maybe that's pessimistic, but uh, just to say that always resonated that, you know, there's so much out there, even though we think there's so many papers and there's so much, you know, knowledge uh, being put forth um, and information about whatever we're interested in. Um, you know, there's vastly many more questions and answers. Um, and um, so that's one particular um, one particular piece of advice that I've received and or just sort of, I wouldn't say that's advice, but that's just maybe some motivation there. Um, you know, I've had others tell me that, you know, whenever I've been struggling, like, oh, can I really do this or and this and this other thing all at the same time? And they say, you know, you can always do more than you think you can, you know. So and not to try to stress yourself out or anything. And obviously you have to have limits, but um, you know, there are some amazing people out there who do everything and um that's kind of the model that they sort of live by. And, you know, I try to remind myself of that when I, you know, think I can't do something. There's always an extra pocket of energy and motivation somewhere. Just need to go look for it. Yeah. And you have to be in the right environment for sure. You know, so yeah. I've been, you know, in min several different environments and some of them I'm very motivated and, you know, much more successful than in other places where, you know, things just don't fit. So a lot of it is not, you know, the best lab or, you know, the, the best project, but also just, you know, what's the best fit for for you as a student, as a postdoc, as a as a faculty member, et cetera. Yeah. Makes sense. That's good advice. Mm -hmm. Always remember how little you know and how much you can keep going. 
Right. Very nice. I just want to say, just to end our conversation, that you are also faculty at Cedar Sinai with our very good friend, uh, Arun Sharma, who is uh, the, the host of our sister podcast, the, the Stem Cell Podcast. I don't know if you know him, but if you ever see him, say hi from us. I know of him, and that um, I did not know he was involved in the your sister podcast. But when I see him, I'll 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 chat with him and say hello. <laughs> Well, thank you for coming on. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, thank you guys. Um, enjoyed meeting you all. And, uh, you know, hope this is helpful. You know, our conversation is helpful for someone. And um, yeah, and I'm always here. So if anyone wants to reach out um, with any, any questions or, you know, if I can help in any way, please let me know. Don't be afraid. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, so much for joining us, uh, Dr. David Gibb from the Cedar sinai Medical Center. He was uh, talking with us about transfusions, RBC antigens, and how to help patients that need them all the time. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. That brings us to the end of our show. Don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at www.immunologypodcast.com to get the show notes, including an episode summary and links to all of the interview and roundup papers. You can also reach out to us on Twitter at Immunopodcast or via email at info at Immunology Podcast with feedback or to suggest a guest. See you next time.